Okay. Um, so we'll just take a minute and recenter, regather. So um, there's some good questions, I appreciate it. Um, the first question was touching on that famous line from the Heart Sutra. The question was about why is um, emptiness form? Seems clear-ish why, why form is empty, but why is emptiness form the other direction? Um, and so that's a good question. And it's of course related to the text that we're doing now, recognizing my mother. How does this all play out? Um, it's, you know, in one sense, it's quite a simple answer in terms of experience. Of course, it's a bit more difficult, but it's the, the teaching that you've heard many times, which is that emptiness does not exist without a referent. Yeah, there has to be something to have the, the quality of emptiness. We have to be pointing to something to refer to emptiness. Yeah, so um, there was a nice little summary of this by um, Geshe Lama Techok, which I thought was kind of pithy and useful. So I'll just read it to you. Um, so this is from Kensu Rinpoche, Geshe Techok. He says, the first point form is empty is relatively straightforward. Form is empty means that form is empty of self-existence. Why is it empty and how do we know it is empty? We know it is empty because form exists through depending on other things and is therefore dependent. It does not exist independent of anything else, so it is not self-existent. It is not something one can see existing independently in and of itself. So since it is not self-existent, it is empty of self-existence, which is why form is empty. To understand the meaning of emptiness is form, consider the emptiness of form. The emptiness of form is its emptiness of self-existence, which is its emptiness of existing independent of anything else. This is form's existence depending upon other factors, which is form itself. So that is the meaning of emptiness is form. Forms existing dependent upon causes and conditions is form itself. This means that there is such a thing as forms existent dependent on causes and conditions, etc. Right? So for there to be form, it has to be empty. For there to be emptiness, it has to be referring to something, for example, form or feeling or discrimination or whatever. So then His Holiness says, um, this is from the book that I use a lot, um, His Holiness's book, Essence of the Heart Sutra. His Holiness says, now let's turn to his next statement that emptiness is form. Since form lacks independent existence, it can never be isolated from other phenomena. Consequently, dependence suggests a kind of openness and malleability in relation to other things. Because of this fundamental openness, form is not fixed, but rather subject to change and causality. In other words, since forms arise from interactions of causes and conditions and do not have independent fixed reality, they lend themselves to the possibility of interaction with other forms and therefore other causes and conditions. All of this is part of a complex interconnected reality. Because forms have no fixed isolated identity, we can say that emptiness is the basis for the existence of form. In fact, in some sense, 
we can even say that emptiness creates form, which ties in very nicely to the text that we're doing, emptiness being the mother or the space of creation. One can then understand the statement that emptiness is form in terms of form being a manifestation or expression of emptiness, something that comes out of emptiness. This seemingly abstract relationship of form and emptiness is somewhat analogous to the relationship of material objects and space. Without empty space, material objects cannot exist. Space is the medium for the physical world. This analogy breaks down, however, in so far as material objects can be said in some sense to be separate from the physical space they occupy, whereas form and the emptiness of form cannot. In the Lankavatara Sutra, we find descriptions of seven different senses in which something can be said to be empty. For our purposes, let's just examine two manners of being empty. So we're talking about emptiness of other. So this is, you know, this is a conversation that is a long one is that we've had many times, but just, you know, don't separate emptiness from what it's referring to. Yeah, don't separate emptiness from what it's referring to. Emptiness is always referring to an aspect all things have. Yeah. So this also helps keep you out of the nihilistic extreme. Um, the another question is, what is spacious awareness in meditation personally? Uh, individually, the, the question seems to be asking um, my own experience. And, you know, I want to be really respectful and really present with the fact that you all value experience near communication. And I think that it's a good way to talk about Dharma, generally speaking. In the case of meditative experiences, it's a bit problematic. Um, and so I can say from my own experience, it gets easier with practice, <laughs> but more than that, um, it's not a good idea because it's in a way easier to relate to content that is your own processing of it. If, you know, if I were to explain my own experience in words, it would either be ordinary or magical. And both of those options are problematic. Yeah, if it's ordinary, then it's boring and why bother? And if it's magical, it's unattainable and why bother? <laughs> so better to say, here's some things that are helpful. I have conviction that they're helpful because of my practice of them over time. You check. Yeah, if you like it, then keep it. If you don't like it, then forget it. Yeah, like that. So I don't want to brush aside your request for experience near, but in this context, it's, it's not really done and it's not a good idea. And very rarely will you hear teachers talk about their own meditative experiences. And if they do, it's usually in a small group and not recorded. So anyway, for what it's worth. So far so good though is the summary. Um, then in terms of technique, there was a third question about um, kind of their experiences, they have um, like a sunset type vision, a lot of maybe imagery and metaphor and poetry come to their mind, but how to take that and go beyond it into experience. And, you know, using imagery and metaphor and poetry is like pointing you in the right direction, but it's not the final end, is it? But to say the final end, you can only kind of get there by pointing. So at some point, experiment with just release the analogy, release the imagery, just kind of allow yourself to go into a spacious, non-reactive place that you've maybe already touched in your ordinary life 
in quiet, contented moments where you're not rushing to fill the space and bring that ability to your cushion. So you're kind of filling your head up with interesting ideas and images and study and then release it and just see where it finds a home. Yeah. And with this kind of meditation, with a clarity of mind meditation and then upgrading it to a Mahamudra meditation, a lot of it relies on a very relaxed mind that's not squeezing. So the main technique is non-reactivity. That's the main technique. Then that non-reactive mind is informed by your study of the philosophical tenets and your study of minds and mental factors, awarenesses and knowers. It's informed by that, but you're not speaking the words of that. So you could have a non-reactive meditation without any study whatsoever, but would you miss the meaning of it? And would you know what to do with it if you hadn't studied? Would you have a direction for it, for example? So um, try not to squeeze, just kind of take what you know so far, be content with what you know so far, now that you're in the meditation space. When you leave the meditation space and you go back to your life, bring back in study analysis, go more and more deeply with your intelligence, and that really helps inform your practice. But right now it's kind of like, let everything you've already learned digest and brew and just gradually integrate. So those were the questions. Um, Ranan, did you want to add any? Yes, concerning the last one, I would like to say that the uh, metaphors are, of course, uh, quite reliable in the very efficient way you pass in order to extricate ourselves from the dualities, the imprinting dualities that is uh, within the conceptual uh, language, and the discursive uh, uh, dialogues, and so on. So metaphors are very good uh, exercises in order to uh, let ourselves uh, out of it. But on the other hand, of course, metaphors are also uh, well, some uh, discursive quality and so on. So I think that uh, what we can do in, in, in the process of uh, uh, transforming ourselves from discursive content to a metaphoric language is to try and I understand the, what, uh, what Newton is uh, suggesting to us uh, to remain in the personal way of uh, searching the, what, what is relevant for each and every one of us, how to go beyond the metaphoric, uh, the poetic uh, expression. What I would like to like to suggest uh, theoretically or meta theoretically even that uh, you you can see how uh, our basic modes, uh, the form of uh, the, the trans transformative uh, path of empathy, is a non-reactive way of being. Uh, when we are uh, the, the Ties uh, expression into being when we uh, introduced it uh, some 25 years ago into the psychoanalytic uh, language uh, in Israel. Uh, it was something to do with uh, uh, the shift between interacting to something else, to interbeing. And I think that the non reactive uh, path of empathy is quite a good uh, channel uh, by which we can uh, cultivate and elaborate our non-reactive uh, experiencing things and existing in a, in a general way. Uh, what does it mean personally? <coughs> we, we have to check it out, we have to explore it. What does it mean to, uh, I would uh, put it in, uh, the word 
the word you know the, the proverb the, the Buddhist proverb of uh, don't uh, don't react reflect don't reflect act can we produce or can we generate out of ourselves actions that would be reactions to something else interdependent in everything of course and yet not a reaction I think that uh, what I am taking from this day uh, uh, teaching and uh, studying uh, on equanimity is that equanimity is uh, the spring, the well of actions without being reactive. And that's why we are, uh, while we can uh, materialize and uh, realize the, the state of being of uh, equanimity. Uh, we do not, we do not, uh, we do not partialize. We are, look, we are, we are behaving in, in a way that uh, is not partializing because we, we are not reacting. We are acting also in a wholesome way. So I think that empathy is uh, for sure one of these uh, ways, one of these channels that can cultivate our uh, pose of uh, equilibrium. Let's have some other questions to return. Oh, yay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, the one, and then there is a place I will ask uh, another. How uh, do we call this part of the mind? which we are using to watch the main mind watching our thoughts. Record is an interesting word. Can you, can you tell me more about what you mean by record? No, not record. How do we call? Call. We call? <laughs> gotcha. Ah, call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No worries. My accent is getting stronger the longer I'm in America. <laughs> Um, you could call it the mental factor of engagement, mental engagement, which is sometimes translated as um, attention. So it's still a mental factor, watching mental factors. You're not really totally in the main mind, bare awareness, but you've simplified. You know, <clears throat> you've simplified because what happens before watching on purpose, what happens before mindfulness, is that different mental factors take turns having kind of dominance or prominence and different main minds, you know, you have your eye main mind, ear main mind, etc. They kind of rotate who is the most important, <laughs> you know, like I'm bored, so I'll use my eye primary consciousness. And now my eyes are bored, I'll use my taste primary consciousness and now blah, blah, blah. And we're just kind of searching for happiness and avoidance of suffering in a kind of instinctual animal way. When we bring intention to it and we bring attention to it, then those can kind of relax into a bit of quietness and we can kind of centralize on the mental experiences for the most part. So the mental primary consciousness to touch it and access it is a more subtle experience than our walking around sensorial experience. So by consciously not reacting to those senses, we do go a bit more subtly. So sometimes it helps to bring in the tantric presentation of the mind, not just the sutra presentation. And in some senses, the tantric presentation is simpler where they talk about, you know, the coarse mind that observes manifest phenomena and the subtler mind that observes hidden phenomena and the extremely subtle mind that will eventually be able to touch extremely hidden phenomena eventually. Um, but right now it's not conditioned to do so. It's like when you do the eight stages of death and you touch the clear light mind, you're not really touching the clear light mind, but you're manufacturing an imaginary experience of that, what actually brings you closer to that. You know, it's, it's like by imagining what it will be, you bring it closer to being that. 
So whether you call it mental engagement or you call it introspection or you call it mindfulness, um, whichever mental factor <laughs> you feel the most resonance with as the watcher, still you're trying to pull it even more subtle and pull it even more subtle by manufacturing with your imagination something that is more close to the subtle experience described by great meditators. But it's always from the course to the subtle, it's always this mental factor that it's uh, mental engagement or attention or intention. Attention with intention, it's always this. Well, you always have attention, whether it's related to any level of mind. You always are focused on something. It's just whether it's on purpose or not. Yes. So in a way, it's like bringing purpose to your intention or maybe bringing the mental factor of intention. It's tricky because intention is also always present. Whether you've adjusted it or not, or noticed it or not, you always have intention. But to say you're setting your intention or bringing your motivation to your mental engagement with some sort of purposefulness, that's the main training is the purposefulness of it. Rather than just letting everything continue under the influence of habit. And really the main essence of all of the meditations is switching on. You know, like getting yourself out of autopilot. Anytime you catch yourself in the drift and bring yourself back, you're deepening your meditative abilities with any topic you want. So even just that itself, that like mindfulness bell of inner clarity for a second that is able to catch, I drifted, now I'm back. That, to stay in that space as long as you can is closer to what we're aiming for. You know that moment of time of catching? You know, you were focused and then you started to drift and then you noticed that you drifted and you said, come back. Mm -hmm. Even if you weren't totally sure what you were coming back to, the mind that calls and reaches and returns. And then there's that kind of clarity that you're kind of like stretching the duration of that. Mm -hmm lengthening that it was that what was used in the mahamudra procedure too yeah right yeah thank you i would like uh, you to if if i may uh, add to Arya's question can you please uh, uh, elaborate about the distinction between attention and introspection as two mental factors, two different mental factors. One is one of the five om omnipresent and one is not. So would, would you, because you, you use the two words as if they are some, somehow synonymous so of yeah, and they're not. It's, it's more like there's, there's different ways of describing what's happening. You know, it's like attention, mental engagement is always there in the sense that you've always landed on something. You know, your mind has always landed on some object or another. Introspection is combining with mindfulness to make sure you don't forget what it is you've decided to land on. So say you've decided I'm meditating on the breath. So attention is abiding on the breath. And then introspection is checking how precise your observation is. And mindfulness is checking, have I forgotten what it is I'm actually focusing on? You know, so they're, they're collaborating. It's just that normally we don't organize them to collaborate. Normally our mind just lands here and lands there in a kind of, a, you know, just karmic winds sort of way. So, you know, we could, we could do a, a minds and mental factors review, but if you just kind of want to think very simply, the mind will land. Introspection and intention and mindfulness are what you're bringing to the fact that the mind lands to make it land on the right thing. That, that's what, the, what makes this engagement 
not as a reaction, but as a wholesome action. Intended well, it's, it's tricky because the way you say reaction makes it sound pejorative always. And is that how you mean? Is reaction always negative? Not always, but it's it's uh, it's haphazard. You know, it's uh, it's uh, random. It's uh, swifting. It's not something mm. that is uh, craving our uh, our past. Yeah, and I mean, we would say like response, you know, we, we don't want to be reactive, but we do want to be responsive. And so it's like you have your bodhicitta motivation and, it, you know, and then you're walking around living your life and occasionally your mindfulness and introspection wake up enough to check, am I still with my bodhicitta motivation? And if it's well conditioned enough, almost as you hear yourself say the critical thing or think the harsh thought, then you respond and, you know, react is the wrong word, but your response to your own mental processes is to adjust, you know? So you are adjusting on purpose. You're not letting things just play out organically, but you're also not forcing it. You know, it's just, it's just a reminder of what you already treasure. It's not a fabrication of something you don't believe. So it's, it's interesting just kind of to see the way in which the wisdom of hearing and the wisdom of contemplation and the wisdom of meditation all start to condition all of our mental factors. And they start to, you know, in a way, carry the wisdom of these things or be imbued with the wisdom of these things until they're so familiar that they're uncontrived. And that's what we mean by a realization, just that it's spontaneous. But for it to become spontaneous, there needs to be a lot of conditioning and non-spontaneous you know, responses and adjustments and responses and adjustments until eventually it becomes this kind of natural, for lack of a better word, experience. I have uh, two questions. One's serious and the other is really not serious. <laughs> so I'll start with the serious. And we were trying to understand the object of negation. So is it a self that is never changing? <laughs> so in every second it's a different self. So this is why it's like if in this second, I know me, and in the other second, it's not know me anymore. Because if it was inherently existing self, then it was not the same know me. So is this no me two point no? <laughs> only one, only two. Only. So is this what we mean by the object of negation? I mean, the object of negation is the inherently existent self. What is the inherently existent self? The self that does not exist at all, even nominally, and yet appears to the mind as 100% true, who we are always. So then we investigate that sense. And in that sense of the I that has always been is a sense of some sort of permanence in the sense of unchanging. There is a sense of core, you know, that is drawing experiences to it or forgetting things from it, but somehow has an essential core personality, soul defining feature. And that feeling of essential defining characteristic, that sense, that's one of the symptoms of having an appearance of an inherently existent self. Yeah, so we're kind of finding it by looking at the symptoms of it. And one of the symptoms of it is that it seems permanent. But there are lots of other symptoms as well. So it's not the, the changing like bodily and mind every second that is uh, the one that we negate, but the feeling that we have a, a permanent self which is uh, ongoing. That's one of the features, yeah. That's one of the features. 
So the fact that the body changes moment to moment, the fact that the mind changes moment to moment are ways for us to understand how the self can't be permanent. The self is merely labeled on things that are changing. Now, of course, the emptiness of the self is permanent and that's tricky, <laughs> but it's just because the emptiness isn't changing moment to moment and a generic image is permanent in one sense. That, that whole conversation can kind of muddy the waters. Right now, we're just talking about experience. When you're trying to capture the experience of inherence and see the way that it's a false thing, it's an illusory thing. When you're doing that experiential investigation, you're trying to find the core, but there is no core. Yeah, but there's an assumption of core before the analysis, isn't there? You know, that this is something that is always me. That's such a me thing to do. That's such a Yintin thing to do, you know, when it's usually just pointing to some habit or the other. So the object of negation is this core feeling sure. that we have. It's not the yeah. bodily changing. Mm -hmm. No, those are the things that help us understand how an inherent self is not possible. <laughs> Thank you. And the not serious question. I would like to add to the question of the, uh, the first part of your question, Nomi. It reminds us uh, the quite uh, uh, postmodern uh, attempt in psychoanalysis, uh, the theory of the multiple selves uh, that come, that, uh, that come uh, in a sense, uh, as an adversary to the self psychology uh, of the Kabushin legacy, uh, the attempt to understand something uh, of the changing of the selves, but the theory of multiple selves uh, is falling into the same trap. In order to uh, explicate ourselves from the reification of the notion of self by uh, creating some theory of multiple self we are giving an inherent existence uh, significance to any moment of self. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, solve the problem. And uh, it, I think uh, it presents uh, the inherent uh, Western uh, trapping in philosophizing of the, of the notion of, of the self. Yeah, we see echoes of this, uh, the absurdities all over the place. Yeah, we, we see people that believe like what essential inner child or people that believe multiple whatever, you know, it's a it's something that's not without presence in society today. Is, is it Netta? Netta. Hey. Um, I want to uh, continue Nomi's questions and it might be a silly question, but I'm struggling with it and uh, I noticed uh, my retreat notebooks that I have this question since beginning, so I must ask it again. If, if you wouldn't uh, tell me that I have to find the non-existing inherently self when I do the meditation, I find the self. So I, I, I don't know what, what do you find when you don't find the self? A mere <laughs> absence. <laughs> absence. Yeah. It's not nothing, it's just not thing, not that thing. You find not that thing. Okay, so it's like, so it's like right now you have realized lack of elephant in the gompa. You've realized that right now. Because you know what an elephant is, you can see there is not one in the gompa. But you had, would have no idea if there was an elephant in the gompa if you hadn't first understood elephant. Right? So the same is true of the self. You, you can't see there is no inherent self until you understand what an inherent self would be were it to exist. So the, what you find is a um, spacious, 
מרחב, ספיישוס מה? ספיישוס סלף? אולי, נסים. So you find a spacious self, self that is less uh, rigid or self that is uh, more... Uh, uh, it's like you, you, find, you find something different than you've always thought. You find the non-finding of your forever assumption. You know, your forever assumption about self, you find to be incorrect. And it's sort of like the whole house of cards falls down, which doesn't mean there's nothing. It means that it's not that thing. And so that's why it's so close to nihilism, but not quite. You know, so the, the appearance to your mind's eye might be a kind of like spaciousness or it might be you know clear autumn dawn like the clear light mind analogy that we use in the eight stages so kind of what appears to your mind's eye might be just kind of a spacious experience but it's like my, my impression has been that when you realize it directly it makes everything else fall apart in a good way in a released way So it's like all of the things that have held you tightly fall apart. And right before that, there is fear because you've never known anything else. But when you kind of let go of all of the guards that have reinforced your dualism, then there's release. And then things like anger and attachment don't have to be overcome. They simply don't make sense anymore. So would you say that... Uh... Um, developing equanimity towards the self is a kind of something that we assure the uh, non-inherent existence of the self? I mean, having equanimity towards the self can mean a lot of different things. Um, you know, if we're talking about Just meditation abiding in equanimity is like not being reactive with applying antidotes or you know when they're not needed you know in the nine stages of mental development abiding in equanimity it means you are well trained enough that you don't overdo the antidotes anymore so you just release into your own proficiency so that's what it means in the context of concentration you released into your own proficiency In the sense of like equanimity with yourself, friends, enemy, stranger, immeasurable equanimity, it's like you're releasing in a different way from what was kind of having essential, unique, different identity holding into kind of an expansive landscape that holds everyone. So it's like, It's like mountains don't make sense anymore. You know, you being at the top of this mountain and someone else being at the top of that mountain and someone being down in a valley, everyone comes up to the same level of land because you realize that we're all empty of inherent existence. Our minds are all with Buddha nature and we all currently have an ignorance which is manifested in a million different weird habits Some of them fun, some of them useful, some of them horrible. So there's a uniqueness on this surface level, but on the deep, deep level, we're very much the same type. So having this kind of push and pull relationship or a centralized sense of self releases. It's like decentralizing. Thank you. Psychological is that when we are experiencing all kinds of senses, we give, a, we give an ontological status of intrinsic, of inherency to what we feel. The first sense self is not intrinsic, existent. That's the only difference. But you, you, are, you do not find the self, you find your experience. And your experiences are real. There's something that uh, are real, a real thing that, that are here. But what is the status of this thing? Is it a thing? Is it a thing in itself or for itself? Or you can analyze it and come to the conclusion that might uh, 
might confuse us, might uh, bring us this uh, feeling that you are struggling with this uh, kind of notion from the beginning of uh, our encounter with the Buddhist uh, notion. And it will continue to, to, to have, uh, to give us a, a good struggle because it's really, it's really something, uh, something sublime to realize. But uh, from the point of, uh, of definitions, uh, you, you feel the sense and sense you experience it. That's all. And you define it as a self, as a findable self. It's not a findable self. It's a felt sense. All kinds of senses and all kinds of feelings. That's all. But you still have to uh, analyze what does it mean, this feeling? What is the status? What is the ontological? Uh, status of it. This is what the four point uh, keys or analysis uh, uh, give us the opportunity. Give us the. I think that we have a, a lack of education in philosophical uh, logic. All of us. We even if we learned enough uh, in our BA or some some someone else, I think that we have a lack in this education. Uh, even in a formal way, not only in the uh, in way of practicing uh, the Dharma, in practicing uh, the transformative mind. Uh, but this differentiation that you feel, you feel what you feel, that's very real. But what does it mean, this real reality? It's still conventional, it's still empty of inherent existence. And, and I think it's a little bit like, you know, I'm imagining in analysis that there is a lot of kind of moments where people land on, oh, that's why I do this, or they do that, or I got this way, or I feel this way. And if they land gently, and then release and, and move through, there can be a lot of positive transformation. If they stick there and begin to identify there, it becomes just another angle of the same trap. So I don't know, you know, this is my guess because I've never been in analysis, but you know, in meditation, when you're training in non-reactivity, there are those moments of release where you're not arguing with yourself, you're not agreeing with yourself, you're not chasing or holding, you've just kind of gone, okay but you're awake, you're alert. And the longest, you know, if you can stay in awake, alert, non-reactive push and pullness, what can happen is that you stay there long enough that it feels like someone owns that space. Yeah, that you've gone, you know, in an airplane up through the clouds, up into the sky, and you're observing all of the world like God, and that's you or you've gone to the bottom of a well and you're looking back up at all of this spaciousness and diversity of things, and there's someone looking up at experience. But what can happen is that if the mind calms and comes back to its natural clarity, there is release, relaxation, stability. But then there's another layer deeper to go because someone starts to identify with that space. And if you can challenge that one, that seems to own awareness or seems to be awareness and everything else all with its own identity. So you just kind of nudge gently with your philosophical understanding until that releases, you know? So it's just a period of you touch something, you go, oh, that's it, that's why and not. Oh, this, that's why and not. So it's just a period of recognizing layers of identification, noticing them with clear eyes and releasing from them. They often describe finding the object of negation as something you have to be very delicate with or the sense of inherent self will run away and you'll pretend like you never had it in the first place. Yeah, and you'll get, you know, turn into kind of a, a dreamy hippie that says, yeah, we're all one, it's fine, you know, until someone argues with your politics or something. And so what you do, and I don't know if this analogy works for you, but for me, I picture the inherent self as a criminal. 
And then my mental factors involved with meditation are good cop and bad cop. Yeah, and good cop says, aren't you wonderful and articulate and intelligent and amazing? And the inherent self says, yes, I am. And the bad cop says, look at how you started that drama and that conflict and have this neuroses and that neurosis. And the inherently existent self says, yes, I do. And it sort of gets confidence. The criminal gets confidence until it confesses. And it confesses and says, yes, I do think I'm inherent. And then you got him. Yeah, and once you've got him, you poke holes in the case and you become a lawyer instead of a cop. And you say, so you say that you created this, prove it, prove it, prove it until it just falls. Yeah, and it's like then the inherent self kind of goes, oh, I can't be real. I'm not real. I'm afraid of what exists if I'm not real, but you know, whatever analogy works for you. But you have to force it into prominence before you can see its lack of existence. That's the main point. Passing to another question uh, for you, and I would like to uh, comment on some one question I was uh, uh, asked concerning my comment in the clinical uh, session this morning about the relationship between the nuclear grandiose self and the nuclear cosmic self. Uh, it would take a bit more than we have now, and I will try to elaborate a bit uh, of it uh, tomorrow. Just to say that uh, for me, concerning the, the vocabulary that uh, resonating this day uh, in the Dharma teaching, I think that uh, it's, not, it's not an exact or accurate uh, met, uh, example, but I think that for me, uh, the relationship between emptiness and, and forms is a uh, kind of this, uh, of this relationship. They are not, the, for example, the, the, the name that God gave to his model, the bipolar self, uh, is a uh, is a kind of uh, dualistic uh, name. The bifurcation between self, between the grandiose self and the cosmic selfhood is not, is not something solid too. They are, not, they are not the same, they are absolutely different, but they are interwoven together without being able to be uh, separate, uh, split off from each other. So in this, thing, in this sense, I think that we should try to understand the, uh, the relationship, the inner relationship between the, these two parts or two dimensions of nuclearity of the self, of the sense of the self. But I will try to, to uh, relate it more specifically to what we will uh, think about tomorrow. Three of venerable young ten and three or one man connects to what you just said. In a, one side, they are uh, negating the, a core cell and an inherent core cell, and uh, in the same uh, in the same time, we are talking about uh, a core cell, which is uh, including the form and <clears throat> maybe the empty. The empty dimension. We we should we, uh, we have to combine this uh, the cohesion legacy and uh, this uh, Mahayana uh, uh, philosophic uh, so view. view. And uh, so I understand that you will tomorrow. Uh, but what what do we want to to ask you to, to contribute to this? Is it? Eh? Can we say that, uh, that there is a core in uh, the, the conventional uh, dimension, but in the same time, this core, like uh, you said earlier, or was described, that this is a, manif a manifestation of uh, the empty dimension. And this core is included 
the included uh, uh, the um, the grandiose in, in the in inclusion uh, um, concept uh, concepts. It's uh, included the the idealized and the, the grandiose uh, self, but in any way, can we say that we can we can talk about core, which is in same time ever changing, and that's why no. it is a manifestation. <laughs> no, but it's a manifestation of a potential which is empty. I mean, if it makes you feel better, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I hesitate to, to centralize and core. I mean, do you remember being a teenager and people telling you, you know, you have to find yourself, I don't know, find yourself, find your career, find your vocation, find it as if it was already there to be found. And then perhaps you had the wisdom of youth and thought, what nonsense I could be whatever, given the traits I have now. I can't be maybe a neuroscientist, but there are many options available to me. I could decide maybe I shall be uh, funny and sarcastic, or maybe I will be funny and kind, or maybe I will be this way, or maybe I will be that way. And at some point in your young adult years, you kind of decided who you had found, but there was no one to be found. It was just kind of a maybe not even noticed assessment of traits that had had a continuity from your previous lives, from the conditioning of your childhood, from your genetics, from your brain, and you just kind of decided, I shall keep these ones and build a self. And these ones I shall let go and let dissolve and they shall not be the self. And then time goes by and it feels real, as if it's who you always were and the one you were meant to find. But it's all just a story. You know, it's a story based on experiences. It's a story based on things that were experienced. It's not like there wasn't experience, but the frame you drew around it or the title you gave it, it's just coming from the mind. It's just a fantasy. So it's comforting to feel there is some sort of core, but I think it can be liberating to let go of that idea because then there's no one to defend and no one to elevate and nothing that needs to be protected. I, I, play with it, to, you know. I, don't want, I don't want to get into an argument, uh, but I would just remind ourselves that core is also an empty uh, conceptualization. But I think that for this, for what you have just said, we might, uh, we might sometimes uh, at the, the, the concept of core uh, to the choice, to the psychological choices that we are making as self-objects and as uh, people in the world. Of course, there are karmatic, uh, karmic uh, conditions and karmic uh, factors, but our choice is already there. Every moment is there. Our past, our choosing the past is the choice. And for me, uh, without making any uh, intrinsic existence to, to the world or to the notion of God, uh, in this conversation, I think that uh, what you have described, uh, it's not a random and it's not, and the non-random is not a deterministic uh, factor in our life. No, no. Karma, is not, karma is not determinism. So I think that uh, the factor of choice, of choosing the existential uh, options that we have to choose, this is something that for me uh, describes uh, uh, the word, the concept of core. Sure, yeah, then use it. <clears throat> Usually it has the connotation of soul or Atman or permanent self, and so I resist it. But if it means something different to you, then keep it. <clears throat> okay, so we sit. And we'll start by sitting in such a way that uh, we gradually build into focus. So just for a moment, allow your mind to be 
free and relaxed and non-specified, and then we'll gently bring it into focus and stabilize in meditation. So for a moment, just let your mind be, let it do what it wants, let it think what it wants, but just gently calming and settling as a preliminary. And just checking in with yourself physically, mentally. Are there any gentle adjustments to make to bring yourself back into balance? And now start to organize those thoughts, still with your own voice, with your own word choices, an inner organization of what your motivation is, the highest one, the deepest one, the most vast. Articulate it to yourself. Let it connect. And to the breath. You bring your attention to the breath, giving it a sense of interest, like you're interested in what the breath is doing, but you're not describing it or judging it. Simply awake to it, watching. Your introspection engaged to see if your attention has left your object or not. Mindfulness remembering it's the breath right now, just the breath.
can shift the mind to analysis. Bring back to your mind the representatives of friend, enemy, stranger. Three people. One which you have attachment towards. One which you have aversion towards. One which you have indifferent towards. Just stabilize your choice. One of each. And now start with the friend. Imagine them in your mind's eye. Maybe the energetic quality of the connection between you. Maybe the sense of well being and comfort you have with them. Maybe just their face. Allow yourself to feel that connection, that affection, knowing that sometimes it's attachment, sometimes it's love, but right now we're just feeling the friendship of it, that worldly sense of it. Holding that connection, now ask yourself, who has this friend? Who is it that feels this friendship? They are a friend of who? They are a friend of me, but who is that one they have a friendship with? Where are they? What are they? Investigate. What exactly is it that they are a friend to? What is it that they are supporting or nurturing, indulging or humoring, loving or craving? Where does that friendship land exactly?
Are they a friend to the things you have in common? Are they a friend to the ways in which you are different and amuse one another? What is supporting? What is supported? Is there something specific you can point to? Tangible, describable, specific. And you might start to think they are a friend to many things about me. A friend based on a many things with me, a shared history. But there's something more, something under, something direct, their self to myself seems so. So find that. So if there was inherent friendship, divorced from context, then both of you could lose your memories completely and friendship would be self-evident and obvious. You could both lose your memories and lead totally separate lives for 10 years conditioned with completely different ethics, politics, religions, philosophies, psychologies. 10 years of separate conditioning. And then you meet again and would have automatic friendship. Could that happen? Would that happen? Is there inherent friendness? at the core between you. And logically, you know there is not. Which is not to say that the friendship isn't valuable or that the history isn't important or that the things you share shouldn't be kept and treasured. What it means is that attachment is nonsense. 
So how can you come back to this sense of friendship, maintaining the strong affection, the wish for their happiness, the warmth, but leaving behind all the exaggerations and story, allowing the attachment to fall away, giving even more space to the love. How delicate, how temporary, how fragile this is. I must treat it with respect because it does not exist from its own side. Now it's even more precious. And so imagine that the friend dissolves and absorbs into you. You carry them with you, your deep affection for them. And you shift your focus to the enemy, the person that you have aversion towards, even if you don't frame it as coarsely as enemy. A person in your life who you really wish was not in your life or was somehow very different. Allow yourself to feel the aversion, the resistance. Acknowledge the fact that there is a pushing away energy within you maybe even shadows of ill will. Be with that, with some objectivity. and acknowledging that relationship, its problematic nature. Now ask yourself, who are they an enemy to? Who are they an enemy of? They're problematic to me in some way, difficult for me in some way. But who is that exactly that they seem to harm specifically? Is it some past self that's already gone that they hurt? Is it anticipation of future harm? How has harm been framed in the first place? Investigate.
And then once again, explore what would need to change for the label you gave them to change. If there was some inherent enemy-ness, there could be no change. And if there is no inherent harm or harmer, divorced from context, impervious to change, then the same must be true of strangers. So allow yourself to examine that experience of feeling like strangers are inherently so. Who is it that they are stranger to? And so just be with that, finding the non-finding, non-inherent friend, non-inherent enemy, non-inherent stranger. Mm -hmm. 
and we dedicate. We, the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.